Hello everyone! Me and my groupmates will report about the Spain Empire and European absolutism. A powerful Spanish Empire. A devout Catholic, Charles not only fought Muslims but also opposed Lutherans. In 1555, he unwillingly agreed to the Peace of Augsburg, which allowed German princes to choose the, the religion for their territory. So the following year, Charles V divided his immense empire and retired to a monastery. To his brother, Ferdinand, he left Austria of the Holy Roman Empire. His son, Philip II, inherited Spain the Spanish Netherlands, and the American colonies. Philip II's empire, Philip the Prudent, like Spanish Philip el Prudente, was shy, serious, and like his father, deeply religious. He was also very hardworking, yet Philip would not allow anyone to help him. Deeply suspicious, he trusted no one for long. As his own court historian wrote, his smile and his dagger were very close. Perhaps above all, Philip could be aggressive for the sake of his empire. In 1580, the king of the Portugal died without an heir. Because Philip was the king's nephew, he seized the Portuguese kingdom. Counting Portuguese strongholds in Africa, India, and the East Indies, he now had an empire that circled the globe. Philip's empire provided him with incredible wealth. By 1600, American mines had supplied Spain with an estimated 339,000 pounds of gold. Between 1550 and 1650, roughly 16,000 tons of silver bullion were unloaded from Spanish galleons or ships. The king of Spain claimed between a fourth and a fifth of every shipload of treasure as his royal share. With this wealth, Spain was able to support a large standing army of about 50,000 soldiers. The Defender of Catholicism When Philip assumed the throne, Europe was experiencing religious wars caused by the Reformation. However, Religious conflict was not new to Spain. The Reconquista, the campaign to drive Muslims from Spain, had been completed only 64 years before. In addition, Philip's great-grandparents, Isabella and Ferdinand, has used the Inquisition to investigate suspected heretics or non-believers of Christianity. Philip believed it was his duty to defend Catholicism against the Muslims of the Ottoman Empire and the Protestants of Europe. In 1571, the Pope called on all the Catholic princes to take up arms against the mounting power of the Ottoman Empire. Philip responded like a true crusader. More than 200 Spanish and Venetian ships defeated a large Ottoman fleet in a fierce battle near Lepanto. In 1588, Philip launched the Spanish Armada in an attempt to punish Protestant England and its queen, Elizabeth I. Elizabeth had supported Protestant subjects who had rebelled against Philip. However, his fleet was defeated. Defeat of the Spanish Armada 1588 In the Spanish of 1588, Philip II sent about 130 ships carrying 19,000 soldiers to the English Channel. English warships, however, outmaneuvered the Spanish vessels and bombarded the Armada with their heavier long-range cannons. Although this setback seriously weakened Spain, its wealth gave it the appearance of strength for a while longer. Philip's grey granite palace, the Escorial, had massive walls and huge gates that demonstrated his power. The Escorial also reflected Philip's faith. Within its walls stood a monastery as well as a palace. Golden Age of Spanish Art and Literature 
Spain's great wealth did more than support navies and build places. It also allowed monarchs and nobles to become patrons of artists. During the 16th and 17th centuries, Spain experienced a golden age in the arts. The works of two great painters show both the faith and pride of Spain during this period. The two great painters are El Greco and Velázquez. Let us first know who is El Greco. El Greco spent much of his adult life in Spain. His real name was Dominicos Teotocopoulos, but Spaniards called him El Greco, meaning the Greek. El Greco's art often puzzled the people of his time. He chose brilliant, sometimes clashing colors, distorted the human figure, and expressed emotion symbolically in his paintings. Although unusual, El Greco's techniques showed the deep Catholic faith of Spain. He painted saints and martyrs as huge long-limbed figures that have a supernatural air. As you can see in the picture, these are his paintings of martyrs and saints. The paintings of Diego Velázquez, on the other hand, reflected the pride of the Spanish monarchy. Velázquez, who painted 50 years after El Greco, was the court painter of Philip IV of Spain. He is the best known for his portraits of the royal family and the scenes of court life. Like El Greco, he was noted for using rich colors. These was his paintings. Don Quixote European novel book, the publication of Don Quixote de la Mancha in 1605, is often called the birth of the modern European novel. In this book, Miguel de Cervantes wrote about a poor Spanish nobleman who went a little crazy after reading too many books about heroic knights. During the time de Cervantes wrote Don Quixote, Spain was still in the grip of Inquisition, a period of intense intolerance and punishment of non-Catholics. Don Quixote's identification with the knight errant life also speaks to the religious fervor of the Crusades, which were at the center of the most tales of chivalry. Unlike other parts of Europe where religious conflicts and divergent sects were splintering the church, Spain remained fully Roman Catholic throughout the 17th century. In much of Don Quixote, the main character acts in accordance with what he sees as religious ideals in the forms of chivalry, though the acts he commits sometimes are at odds with his. The following topics will be reported by my other groupmates. The Spanish Empire Weekends The gold and silver coming from the Americas made Spain temporarily wealthy. So Spain briefly became rich largely to the silver and gold that came from the Americas. However, this treasure contributed to the long-term economic issues. Next is inflation in Spain had two main causes. First, Spain's population had been growing. One of these problems was severe inflation which is a decli decline in the value of money accompanied by a rise in the prices of goods and services. As more people demand for food and other goods, merchants were able to raise prices. Second, a silver bullion flooded the market. Its value dropped. Second, the price of silver decreased as a silver bullion flooded the market. Silver became even more necessary for people to purchase goods. People need more and more amounts of silver to buy things. Next is Spain's economic decline also had other causes. When Spain expelled the Jews and Moors or the Muslims around 1500s, 
it lost many valuable artisans and business people. In addition, Spain's nobles did not have to pay taxes. So other factors contributed to the Spain's economic downturn as well. Around 1500s, Spain evicted the Jews and the Moors or the Muslims. And as a result, it lost many skilled craftsmen and entrepreneurs. Additionally, Spain's nobility was exempt from paying taxes. Lower classes bore the brunt of the tax burden. They were unable to accumulate sufficient wealth to launch their own firms because of that load. Spain never created a middle class as a result. Next, the tax burden fell in the lower class. That burden prevented them from accumulating enough to wealth to start their own businesses. As a result, Spain never developed a middle class. The Dutch revolt in the Spanish in the Spanish Netherlands, Philip had to maintain an army to keep his subjects under control. So the Dutch had little in common with their Spanish rulers, while Spanish was Catholic. The Netherlands had many Calvinist congressions. Also, Spain had a sluggish economy, while the Dutch had a prosperous middle class. So when we say is when we say Calvinist, they use only to the true sacraments defined in the Bible, which is the baptism and the Holy Communion. So Calvinists were not allowed to sing any words except those found in the Bible. At services, they sang verses from the Bible to set popular tunes. And when we say a sluggish economy, it is an economy that is experiencing little or no macroeconomic growth. It may be characterized by falling GDP growth or high unemployment. Next in is in response in 1566, angry Protestant moves swept through Catholic church churches. So Philip then sent 593 army under the Spanish Duke of Alba to punish the rebels. On a single day in 1568, the Duke executed 1,500 Protestants, unsuspected rebels. Next is the Tulip Mania. So Tulip Mania, it is also called a Tulip Craze. It is a Dutch Tulpen Wendel, a speculative frenzy in 17th century Holland over the sale of tulip bulbs. Tulips were introduced to Europe from Turkey shortly after 1550. And the delicate form, form vividly colored flowers became a popular, if costly, item. So tulips are among the most popular of all garden flowers and numerous cultivars and varieties have been developed. The flowers were introduced into Western Europe and Netherlands in the late 16th century. So the tulip has become synonymous with Netherlands. Uh, tourists from around the world visit the country just to see the bright colored flower and the astonishing view over the flower fields. So the next is the independent Dutch Prosper. So the United Provinces of the Netherlands was different from other Euro European states of the time. For one thing, the people there practiced religious toleration. In addition, the United Provinces was not a kingdom but a republic. Each province had elected governor, whose power depended on the support of the merchants and landholders. Next is the Dutch art during the 1600s. The, the, the Netherlands became what Florence had been during the 1400s. It boasted not only the best, best banks but also many of the best artists in Europe. So Rembrandt van Rijn. He was the greatest Dutch artist of the period. 
Rimbrandt painted portraits of wealthy middle class merchants, he also produced group portraits. In the Night Watch, he portrayed a group of city guards. Rembrandt used sharp contrast of light and shadow to draw attention to his focus. Another artist fascinated with the effects of light and dark was Jan Vermeer. Like many other Dutch artists, he chose domestic and their settings for his portraits. He often painted women doing such familiar activities such as spouring milk from a jug or reading a letter. The work of both uh, Rembrandt and Vermeer reveals how important merchants, civic leaders, and the middle class in general were in 17th century Netherlands. So the Dutch Empire helped establish a global trade market, introduced Euro Europeans to many luxuries like spices and tea from the east, enriched their trading partners, and pioneered the stock market. At the same time, it exploded the native people in the lands they conquered and took away their freedoms. Absolutism in Europe. So even though Philip II lost his Dutch possession, he was a forceful, forceful ruler in many ways. So he tried to control every aspect of his empire's affair. So during the next few centuries, many European monarchs would also claim the authority to rule without limits on their power. The theory of absolutism is these rulers wanted to be absolute monarchs, kings or queens who held all of the power within their state's boundaries. So their goal was to kind of, control every aspect of society. So absolute monarchs believed in divine right. So the idea that God created the monarchy and that the monarch acted as God's representative on earth. So an absolute monarch answered only to God not to his or her subjects. Absolutism. Absolutism was the political belief that one ruler should also hold the power within the boundaries of a country. So, although practiced by several monarchs in Europe during the 16th through 18th centuries, absolutism has been used in many regions throughout history. So, in ancient times, Shi Wangdi in China Darius in Persia, and the Roman Caesars were also absolute rulers. So what are the causes why there is absolutism? Okay, so number one there is the religious and territorial conflicts created fear and uncertainty. Number two, the growth of armies to deal with conflicts caused rulers to raise taxes to pay troops. And number three, heavy taxes led to additional unrest and peasant revolts. Here now is the effects of absolutism. Number one, rulers regulated religious worship and social gatherings to control the spread of ideas. Number two, rulers increased the size of their courts to appear more powerful. And number three, Rulers created bureaucracies to control their country's economies. Religious Wars and Struggles So in 1572, the St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre in Paris sparked a six-week nationwide slaughter of Huguenots. So the massacre occurred when many Huguenot nobles were in Paris. So in 1589, when both Catherine and her last son died, Prince Henry inherited the throne. So when Prince Henry inherited the throne, um, he became Henry IV, the first king of the Bourbon dynasty in France. So as king, he showed himself to be decisive, fearless in battle, and a clever politician. So many Catholics, including the people of Paris, opposed Henry for the sake of his war-weary country. 
So Henry chose to give up Protestantism and became a Catholic. So explaining his conversion, Henry reportedly declared Paris is well worth a mass. In 1598, Henry took another step towards healing Franz wounds. He declared that the Huguenots called a could live in peace in France and set up their own houses of worship in some cities. So this declaration of religious toleration was called the Edict of Nantes. Aided by an advisor who enacted wise financial policies, Henry devoted his reign to rebuilding France and its prosperity. He restored the French monarchy to a strong position. After a generation of war, most French people welcomed peace. So some people, however, hated Henry for his religious compromises. So in 1610, a fanatic leaped into the royal carriage and stabbed Henry to death. Religious Wars and Struggles Louis XIII and Cardinal Richelieu after Henry IV's death, his son Louis XIII reigned. The efforts of Henry IV and Richelieu to strengthen the French monarchy paved the way for the most powerful ruler in French history, Louis XIV. Louis was a weak king, but in 1624, he appointed a strong minister who made up for all of Louis' weaknesses. Louis XIII became engaged to Anne of Australia. Though Louis XIII displayed courage on the battlefield, his mental instability and chronic ill health undermined his capacity to sustain concentrations on affairs of state. As you can see here in the picture, this is Louis XIII. Next one is Cardinal Richelieu. Cardinal Richelieu became, in effect, the ruler of France. So he continued to rise through the hierarchy of both the Catholic Church and the French government by becoming a cardinal in 1622 and chef, chief minister to King Louis XIII of France in um, 1624. He retained that office until his death in 1642 when he was successful by Cardinal Mazarin whose career he had fostered. Um, for several years, he had been a hard-working leader of the Catholic Church in France. Although he tried sincerely to lead according to moral principles, he was also um, ambitious and enjoyed exercising authority. Richelieu um, took two steps to increase the power of the Bourbon monarchy. Richelieu ordered nobles to take down their fortified castles. He increased the power of government agents who came from the middle class. The king relied on these agents, so there was less need to use noble officials. Richelieu also wanted to make France the strongest state in Europe. Second, he sought to weaken the absolute and the nobles' power. Richelieu also wanted to make France the strongest state in Europe. Um, he sought to consolidate power, royal power and strengthen France's international position. To limit Habsburg power, Richelieu involved France in the Thirty Years' War. Richelieu was instrumental in redirecting the Thirty Years' War from the conflict of Protestantism versus Catholicism to that of nationalism versus Habsburg hegemony. Through the war, France effectively drained the already overstretched resources of the Habsburg Empire and drove it inexorably towards bankruptcy. Next is the writer's turn towards skepticism. As France regained political power, a new French intellectual movement developed. The long-term impact on France was profound, shaping politics, society, religion, and ideas, and politics for more than a century. French thinkers had witnessed the religious war with horror. 
What they saw turned them towards skepticism, the idea that nothing can be ever known for a certain. Um, these thinkers expressed an attitude of doubt toward churches that claim to have the only correct set of doctrines. To doubt and old ideas, um, skeptics thought was the first step toward finding truth. Montage and Descartes Michael de Montage lived um, during the worst years of the French religious war. So, after the death of a dear friend, Montage thought deeply about life's meaning. To communicate his um, ideas, Montage developed a new form of literature, which is the essay. An essay is a brief work that expresses a person's thoughts and opinions. In one essay, uh, Montage pointed out that wherever a new belief arose, it replaced an old belief that people once accepted as truth. Some scholars argued that um, Montage began writing his essays as a one to be stoic, hardening himself against the horrors of the French civil and religious wars. And his griefs uh, at the loss of his best friend through the century. Um, in some ways, he went on the new belief he would also probably be replaced by some different idea in the future. Um, for those reasons, Montage believed that humans could never um, have absolute knowledge of what is true. Another French writer at the time is René Descartes was a brilliant, who is a brilliant thinker. So, as you can see in the picture, René Descartes was a creative mathematician of the first order, an important scientific thinker, and an original metaphysician. Um, in his meditations on first philosophy, Descartes examined the skeptical argument that one could never be certain of anything. Descartes continues his skepticism with the demon theory during the meditations. Descartes admits that God could not be deceiving us because of his goodness. Descartes doubted in the first meditation that he has a body and therefore relied on actions he can rely on and not the bodily ones. Descartes uses observations and his reasons and answers such arguments. In doing so, he created a philosophy that influenced modern thinkers and helped to develop the scientific method. Because of this, he became an important figure in the Enlightenment. So the other um, reports will be reported by my group mates. Louis XIV comes to power. The efforts of Henry IV and Richelieu to strengthen the French monarchy paved the way for the most powerful ruler in French history, Louis XIV. In Louis' view, he and the state were one and the same. He reportedly boasted, La tasse moi, meaning, I am the state. Although Louis XIV became the strongest king of his time, he was only a four-year-old boy when he began his reign. Louis the Boy King when Louis became king in 1643, after the death of his father, Louis XIII, the true ruler of France was Richelieu's successor, Cardinal Mazarin. So who is Cardinal Mazarin in the life of King Louis XIV? After the death of Richelieu in 1642 and Louis XIII in 1643, Mazarin was appointed first minister of France by Anne of Austria, regent for Louis XIV, and he directed Louis' education. A highly influential advisor to the young king, he helped train a staff of able administrators. Mazarin's greatest triumph came in in 1643, when the ending of the Thirty Years' War. Many people in France, particularly the nobles, hated Mazarin 
because he increased taxes and strengthened the central government. From 1643 to 1653, violent anti-Mazarin riots tore France apart. At times, the nobles who led the riots threatened the young king's life. Even after the violence was over, Louis never forgot his fear or his anger at the nobility. He determined to become so strong that they could never threaten him again. In the end, the nobles' rebellion failed for three reasons. Its leaders distrusted one another even more than they distrusted Mazarin, the government used violent repression, and lastly, peasants and townspeople grew weary of disorder and fighting. For many years afterward, the people of France accepted the oppressive laws of an absolute king. They were convinced that the alternative rebellion was even worse. Louis weakened the nobles' authority when Cardinal Mazarin died in 1661. The 22-year-old Louis took control of the government himself. He weakened the power of the nobles by excluding them from his councils. In contrast, he increased the power of the government agents called intendants who collected taxes and administered justice. To keep power under central control, he made sure that local officials communicated regularly with him. Economic Growth Louis devoted himself to helping France attain economic, political, and cultural brilliance. No one assisted him more in achieving his goals than his Minister of France, that is Jean Baptiste Colbert. So who is Jean Baptiste Colbert? So Jean Baptiste Colbert was a French statesman who served as First Minister of State from 1661 until his death in 1683 under the rule of King Louis XIV. Colbert believed in the theory of mercantilism. What is mercantilism? It is an economic theory that advocates government regulation of international trade to generate wealth and strengthen national power. Merchants and the government work together to reduce the trade deficit and create a trade surplus. To prevent wealth from leaving the country, Colbert tried to make France self-sufficient. He wanted it to be able to manufacture everything it needed instead of relying on imports. To expand manufacturing, Colbert gave government funds and tax benefits to French companies. To protect France industries, he placed a high tariff on goods from other countries. Colbert also recognized the importance of colonies, which provided raw materials and a market for manufactured goods. The French government encouraged people to migrate to French's colony in Canada. There, the fur trade added to French trade and its wealth. That ends our report. Thank you so much for listening.